Well, I'm suggesting that for some of the problems in might be in science, might be in philosophy, probably it might be better to scrap the ease. Thank you. Ethics in quantum physics, and I think in nature, is, is seen from an informational point of view. There's this uh, aspect of entropy. And uh, entropy is basically a, a, a measurement of disorder. So the typical example is a teenager's room. It's high entropy. And this is the thing that I know that it says that this entropy can never fall. It keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger. So uh, let's say, for example, the, in a common example, you have a, a glass of water and then you put in an ice clump. The water molecule is in an ice clump, it's very ordered, it sits in a, in a, in a special a crystal. So the distance between the water molecules in the ice form is very ordered, so it's low entropy. Then you put down into the water and then it, it melts. Uh, before it melts, then there is a large difference, disharmony, you can say between the water that is in solution and the water that is in the crystal form. <coughs> the water that is in solution, they have all kinds of distances. They're moving around rapidly. And if they come up into the gas phase, they will have even more uh, movement around and will be more different. While the molecules in the crystal are fixed with certain lengths. So while it's not melted, there's a large difference, disharmony, disequilibrium between the water in solution and the water in the crystal. Then the crystal melts and uh, it forms into, goes into equilibrium with the rest of the water. The temperature is uniform in the entire glass. Before the temperature was low in the crystal, the, in the ice and high in the water. Now the temperature has leveled out. So there's a state after the melting process, there's a state of harmony or state of equilibrium in this glass. What then, now we take another fundamental, probably more fundamental entity of the description of reality, information. We, instead of, we take out this, we have this still the system, and then we take out uh, the water molecules and then put in bits of information. In such a system, you can also have harmony. And you can have disharmony. Harmony is ethics. Harmony in a system where there's information, made out of information, this uh, physical, uh, basic, foundational f formulation of ethics. It has nothing to do with man or the Buddha or God. Or it's not something that we can change. Uh, it's, not it's not relative in time and space. If you kill a, a, another person in a thousand universes from now on, then the karmic retribution will be the same as it is now. And if you kill it in another universe, it will be the same. So it's apparently a law is something that is, 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 has to be respected because it's not, it's not a cultural phenomenon, basically. It's a natural phenomenon. And uh, as I see it, it's basically, ethics is basically harmony in a system, or equilibrium, or balance is a system based on information. If, for taking a practical example, let's say you have a person at your workplace, and there's a one person, he's a notorious liar. There's a lot of persons, they speak the truth, no problem, everybody is peaceful. And then you introduce, you drop, drop one liar there. Then this creates a lot of disharmony in this uh, social work sphere. This disharmony, you can say from a moral point of view, is because of his lie. But you can say the disharmony from an informational point of view is because he's not speaking the truth. He's speaking about states, he says it's like A, then it's like B. Uh, so he's, he's speaking of something that goes against nature, so to speak. And therefore the retribution, uh, which is not a, a form of revenge, but just a, a nature's probabilistic response on single individuals, not conforming to the truth, not being in harmony with the truth, being in disequilibrium, a uh, far from uh, equilibrium state. And this, if I, you can say, I will also now take this, uh, the equilibrium state energetically for this one as well being on the table or even on the floor, or, in the ultimate sense, at the center of the planet Earth. Now I'll take it away from equilibrium. As soon as I release it, then it, it sinks back to equilibrium. And the same thing with the ice in the, in the water. 
uh, it also goes back to equilibrium by nature. And so also we as information processing units, we also will go back to equilibrium, whether we like it or not. So the liar will become a truthful person? Eventually he will. Okay, we'll take the next question. Ah, yeah, yeah, please. Speak to this. I just cannot understand why we are so obsessed with quantum mechanics. It just shows how far away we all of us are from Nibbana. This conference or whatever it is, is merely states that we are full of avijja. It's just avijja, nothing else, right? And we talk of, I mean, I gave my lecture on quantum ontologies just to mention that all these ontologies are relevant to or relative to the observers. There is no objective or whatever, what uh, Professor Kundratna called is or real or whatever, independent of the observer. And what time, what I just said was that there are five ontologies, at least in quantum, and uh, at least three ontologies in classical. So anybody who will listen to me carefully would have come to understand that there is no ontology as such. In fact, I changed my topic to ontologies just to say that there is no ontology as such. There is no existence as such, independent of the observer. And, well, I, I did my some research work in quantum and relativity. But I know that neither relativity nor quantum mechanics is the truth. And whenever somebody gets up and say, try to explain Buddhism in terms of quantum mechanics or science, I just, even in my old age, my pressure goes up. I must say that. Because now there was no quantum mechanics just 100 years ago, before Planck, 1905 or 1895. Now, what will happen if there is another quantum theory which is opposed to quantum mechanics or which contradicts quantum mechanics coming to existence in the say next 50 years or so? Those of us who compared Buddhism with quantum mechanics, if we were fortunate or unfortunate to live another 50 years, we'll have to eat our own words. Because another, if another theory replaces quantum mechanics and we now try to justify Buddhism in terms of quantum mechanics and if quantum mechanics is displaced, what is going to happen to Buddhism? Buddhism will also be displaced. <laughs> Whether Theravada or Mahayana or Hinayana or Vajra or whatever it is, Shunyata or anything. Please, I don't agree with these comparisons. And uh, I would have loved to speak on this topic for another hour, but I uh, you know time permits and uh, I will not be allowed to do so. All I have to say is that we have our own ethics based on, well, I mean, I am a Buddhist, right? My Buddhism may be not quite correct, but uh, I don't uh, misquote Buddhism and I don't uh, try to fit Buddhism into my way of living. I try to live according to Buddhism and not try to interpret Buddhism according to my living. But I think that all these are avijja. Avijja, Pachya, Sankara, all these are constructed due to avijja. What is avijja? Avijja is not knowing the Trilakshana, 
Anicca Dukkanatma and please remember that what he said is Sabbe Sankara Anicca. Sabbe Sankara Dukkha and Sabbe Dhamma Anatta. Sabbe Sankara means what is Sanskara? <laughs> if I may use, if I may uh, uh, anglicize Sankara, you Sanskarize. And because uh, it's very difficult to translate Sanskara into English, so let's use the same word. You Sanskarize due to Avicca. And what is Sanskarized is Anicca. What is Sanskara is this Dukkha. Not what is, not what is, what exists is Dukkha, what exists is Sanicca. What is Sanskara is, and what exists, nobody knows. We don't want to talk about what exists, the existence. They are all relative, relative to the observers. And the observers who are being <coughs> nourished <coughs> by Avicca. All avijja, and if we can realize that it is all avijja soon or later, then we would attain nibbana. <coughs> and that's my view. And sabbe dhamma anatta means there is something which is not sanskara, and that's nibbana. <coughs> nibbana is also anitta. I think I, I leave my case there. I suppose. Uh, uh, very much we talk. We are not going to attain Nibbana in a minute or in a half an hour. So, so better not compare Buddhism with any science, whether quantum or Newtonian or thermodynamics or anything, right? Because the existence, existence not in uh, not in the realistic sense, but uh, the common sense. The existence of these theories are limited. Please remember, if anything that history or science teaches us is that all these theories are very, very impermanent. And if you try to compare Buddhism with these theories, and if once the theories go out, once the theories are displaced by some other theories, then Buddhism is also displaced. I don't want to be a party to that. We'll take that question. I would ask for the, I ask you, is that one of the states that you mentioned, that the portal fields, hmm? is it one of the infinite solutions that just one that go into the same? No, no, no. Of course, I mean, I didn't explain that. Uh, now, say this has been discussed long time ago. If you read Mageloge, Mageloge discusses all these things. And in fact, it discusses uh, a space uh, experiment as well, as people were referred to by Venerable Samahita. That has been discussed, right? It's a old, <laughs> old question, right? Now, what, happen is, what happens is this. Say, when an electron is emitted, of photon is emitted. You may have particle or wave, wave, wave properties. That will be in various states. <coughs> because when you shoot a photon or an electron, its energy is determined. Its momentum is determined. Energy momentum are determined. Now, please, I am not saying that quantum mechanics is right. It's just, right? I am using quantum experiment. You explain this. That's all. I, I, I think all these sciences are Pattabal Boru. That's a different story altogether, right? So, I don't know if there, there are any scientists here. <laughs> we'll discuss that later during the lunch break. Hmm? Now, <clears throat> since energy is determined, Shanta, you are also a scientist, I know. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, when the energy is determined and the momentum or the velocity is determined, 
the position and time are not determined. So this can be anywhere. This electron can be anywhere. Not that it's at this point or this. It's everywhere. It's everywhere in space as well as, 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 well as it's everywhere in time. What happens is that these two states give two particular states. And if the states, if the states are open, the electron or the photon or whatever it is will take those two states. Those two states will interfere to give the interference pattern. If one of the states is closed, then it has only one state and the photon takes that state of infinite number of states. It takes that state. Right? So the question that Wheeler wanted to find out some 20 years ago, which uh, I answered to today, that it is the photon by itself has no time or space. Time and space are determined by us. We say it after the photon has, because say we know the position of the shoot, right? And we know the time and the distance. Then we know the velocity. If you know the velocity, then you can calculate easily the time taken by the photon or the, or the electron to move from the position of the gun to the screen. Then any time after that, for us, it's after. But for the photon or the electron, it's infinite number, right? It's not just one. So, it can change even according to us after it has passed the state. But again, quantum mechanics, like any other science, is but a bulbur. Well, it takes a lot of time for some people to realize that it is part of our world. <laughs> um, yes, a question from here. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good question. Language is essential. 
only the lovers can communicate without language. I think most of us have that experience in our young ages. Now we are mental, but uh, we don't. <laughs> We don't communicate at all now, <laughs> with or without language. It's a different story. But language is important. Without language, we can't com we cannot communicate, and uh, we want to express our ideas, right? But the point is, as I think uh, it was Wittgenstein who said uh, long time back that uh, philosophy is a problem of language. Finally, now is <coughs> yes, yes, language is the uh, is a problem. And uh, all we had to know is that language is limited and the meanings have been given by the society. And the society, the, the meanings that, it, that the society give changes with time. So that, that's one of the problems that we come across when we read an old uh, text. Now during the court period, they used to say, Inga Sunga Gathai ki meetina. Sunga means pot duck. Right? But uh, Sunga today has a different meaning. We don't say it in today's context. Uh, looking at a young girl and say, Inga Sunga Gathai ki meetina. We don't say that. So these are problems in language where you, know, you should know that languages are limited. And we should also know that all these are again lies. Lies in the sense the meanings are given by society and these meanings, they are not truth. Their meanings are given by society and these society, they are all relative and they can change, change, change with time. And, and uh, I suppose uh, without giving much weightage to language. I'm not trying to say that you should not uh, study languages or teach languages, but without giving much weightage to languages, we should try to communicate with the bare essential meanings. And knowing very well that meanings are also relative. Meanings are also relative. And uh, these, the sense of a relativist philosophy and also not only that, not only meanings are relative but meanings are created, created. So that's essentially the philosophy, I, not that, it's not a philosophy that philosophy is correct but the philosophy I, I adhere to. Okay. Yes, sir. No, about uh, the language. In fact, uh, I, that's why I said better get rid of the word is from the language. Uh, but about the quantum mechanics, uh, that's, uh, that's one of the I mean, first problems that they faced. That's why I'm going by the, now, Niels Bohr, the Copenhagen people. They wanted to, I mean, the point is that we live in the, we are part of the classical world. We are big macro optics. We are not quantum, I mean, we are not, I mean, as we, as we are, we are not. So, so that we have to use the macro optic language, you know, the classical language. And that's, uh, that's one of the first principles that uh, the Copenhagen is said. That you cannot get rid of the wave particle duality. The, the, the both characteristics. Those are macro characteristics. But we cannot get rid of them. We have to use them and somehow or they express the quantum situation. That was the, that's a problem. And of course it is a problem. In fact, I just said that uh, David Bohm was trying to say well, we should give up this type of concepts that I use, but to have a real mode. That's what you, you know, tell but whether it's possible to successfully complete such a project is a, is, I mean, a massive question. And uh, the other thing well, about language, but, uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, well, language changes, I mean, all those things are there. In fact, I was to ask Professor, Professor Nalini De Silva, this, after some time, didn't Avila ask the question, 
about this is what happens if you cross both seats. Both seats. If you see, you said cross one seat after some time. Suppose you cross both both seats after some time, after some photons and parts. What would happen? Nobody knows what will happen if both seats are closed relative to us after relative to us after the photons have passed through the seats. But one thing is known, right? In fact, just three weeks ago, it was reported that they had done an experiment using satellites for this particular idea that it closes one of the slits and. Uh, they have come with the result that even after closing, even uh, even uh, well, even after closing, after the electrons have passed, well, they use satellites and got them reflected. That uh, they behaved like they they didn't give interference pattern. So that means after and before, as far as photons or they said photons, not electrons. As far as photons are concerned, after and after and before have no meaning to them if energy and momenta are defined. If energy and momenta are defined, because if energy and momenta are defined, then time and space are not defined. That's the I think that's the complementary uh, in quantum the, the answer to your question: What happens if uh, both streets are closed. No experiment has been done so far. But uh, I suppose nothing will happen. Nothing will happen since there will be no interference patterns, neither there will be any uh, any uh, point like uh, figures. Right? Nothing will happen in the sense that it, it will behave like as if there was no slit at all. It was just a blind screen. And this this my prediction, so somebody has to do an experiment, a physicist in Peradeniya, if possible, do an experiment to find out what happens if both slits are closed after after, according to us, the photons have passed through the slits. And my prediction, my prediction today is that nothing will happen in the sense photons will behave as if there was a solid screen and without any slits. Okay. And just just uh, just one, can I? Uh, this uh, question or language. Uh, I think the, the problem, as uh, uh, Professor Gunaratna mentioned, Neil Bo, he said, one of the problems with quantum mechanics is that we have to use classical language in order to explain quantum physics. Now even here we use classical language because we don't know, now classical language is constructed by us using our day-to-day -day experience. Day-to-day -day experience, either this or that, that is one of the experience, either this or that, either wave or particle. And also we have certain models, waves and particles. Now we try to explain quantum mechanical properties using waves, waves, particles, and also this Aristotelian logic. And I did not open another <laughs> topic. Aristotelian logic, right? But whether Aristotelian logic can be applied in the case of quantum particles is a different story. And uh, this question of particle passing through two slits means that the particle is at both slits. Particle is at both slits and it can pass through both slits within quantum mechanics frame. But uh, in Sri Lanka, only politicians can pass through two doors. <laughs> so, so I think quantum mechanics is applicable to politicians, right? <laughs> but not to the others. But he, the problem is there that Quantum mechanics has to be explained in terms of classical concept. And this is a problem that even Buddha faced. Even though he did not 
approve those things. And of course, he tried to give different meanings to this, those terms like Brahmana, Vati Brahmana, and so these are Asian language. Anyway, I'll stop there. Yes, uh, I agree with the two others. Uh, you have to use classical language, and this is a problem. For example, this is, as soon as you say is, you imply without noticing it, this is a static existence. The moment you say, which language you say, Hoti, you say becoming, then you thereby say anything is dynamic, which is more true. However, uh, language is the only thing we got. <laughs> we don't have any other choice. Huh? Uh, however, we can uh, modify, we can make new concepts, for example, entanglement, understanding that things can be entangled over space and time, and uh, non-locality. So we can exchange new ideas using language. However, language will, it, is never perfect. Some modern poets said that language is a, a virus from outer space. And uh, there's some truth to it, because there's some alien thing that makes us believe this or that, for example, that static existence when we say is, that is not the case, that is not the case. The Buddha said about this, the same thing about Nibbana, how do you express Nibbana, the, the goal of Buddhist training, it is in principle ineffable, it cannot be expressed because language is invented to express something in samsara in this world, and Nibbana is outside this world, so it is it's not even imaginable. But still, and this he, he, he called the largest miracle. The largest miracle is not levitation uh, or reading other people's mind, or something like that. The largest meaning is that the instruction is possible, that you convey, convey, can convey exact meaning using an inexact language. So, well, it's our, it's our best tool, but it's also our worst enemy. And I agree, it is an elephant in any room where communication takes place. Okay, um, thank you. I think uh, we come to more or less to the conclusion of the morning session, <coughs> paving the foundations for the second session. Now, coming back, or rather continuing on to what this issue of language, let me tell you two things. One is, I think it is Gandhi who said that you can't find a solution in the same language in which the problem was created. Because no matter how hard you try, you will be dwelling in the same problem more and more rather than finding a solution. Look at what is happening to the world. Um, if there are any sociologists around here, um, you would know that uh, the classical sociology, and speaking of the languages, try to understand the social change, how the societies change using either Durkheimian, Weberian, or Marxian language. And the sociology has been pathologically suffering from this problem until Anthony Giddens, as a living sociologist, he probably is the, the greatest social theorist or philosopher living right now, he exactly said the same thing answering your question, sir, that the, the problem why we cannot understand the society, in that case the world, is uh, the epistemological problem. We are trying to understand a world in where things happen in a language where we uh, use the language in a static terms. Classic word is structure. If you look at the sociology, the societies expect explain their structures all the way from Marx Weber to Marx, uh, sorry, uh, Durkheim Weber to Marx. And to respond to that, he said the only way to do that is to have, you know, identify the elephant and perhaps change the elephant, or chase the elephant out of the room. He did that. He said the only way we can understand modern society is not through the concept of structure, but structuration turning nouns into verbs, saying anicca. Things change all the time. The moment you have nouns, you give a static meaning to that. So change things into this uh, you know, process. Rather than talking about social structure, teach the structuration. 
structurations in the process of becoming or making and unmaking structures on, on the split seconds that he was trying to tell us. Anyway, so maybe that is a good uh, point to end our discussion about this larger ontology versus epistemology into the <coughs> more into the social level. Oh yeah, absolutely yes. So maybe the last word is Go ahead, you want to use no, this word? I think it's it would have been much better if we had only verbs. <laughs> but it's, you know, so unfortunately we have we have nouns and singular language. I don't know about Tamil, but uh, it's, it's quite close to the singular. But uh, singular language emphasizes verbs much more than the nouns. And just to give an example, we can express certain things without nouns. We can say Vahinama. No, no noun in that. Vahinama. It's just a verb. But in English, you cannot say Vahinama. You have to say, it is raining. It is raining. O Vahinama. <laughs> most uh, sought after work right at this moment is closing this session. We are coming closer to lunch time and well I, I must thank the three presenters and those who raise questions and answers as well. We are right on time and I guess we should close the session uh, giving way for our next uh, item in the agenda. Okay. So over to the organizers.